Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. And in our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about Dr. Thomas Schelling, who died recently at the age of 95. Dr. Schelling was a co-winner of the 2005 Nobel Prize in Economics, along with Dr. Robert J. Allman. And Dr. Schelling won his award for his work on game theory which means he joins our other Nobel Prize winners who we've done podcasts on, John Nash and Reinhard Selden. The work of Dr. Schelling, who was trained at Berkeley and who taught at Harvard and Yale before becoming the Distinguished University Professor in the University of Maryland's Department of Economics and School of Public Policy, was more than theoretical, it was practical. And ironically, at its greatest practicality in nuclear strategy and the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union. Not only that, but Dr. Schelling's work is also responsible in part for one of the great black comedies of movies of all time, which we'll talk about in a little while. Here is the Nobel Committee announcement of the 2005 Nobel Prize in Economics to Dr. Schelling. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences has decided to award the Bank of Sweden a prize in economic sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel for the year 2005 jointly to Robert Aumann, Center for Rationality, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel, and Thomas Schelling, Department of Economics and, S and School of Public Policy, University of Maryland, College Park, Maryland, USA. And the citation runs for having enhanced our understanding of conflict and cooperation through game theory analysis. Why do some groups, organizations, and countries succeed in fostering cooperation while others suffer from conflict? Thanks to the work of Robert Aumann and Thomas Schelling, has game theory, or interactive decision theory, become the dominant approach to this age-old question. Thomas Schelling showed how, in a conflict, one party can strengthen its position by visibly limiting or worsening its own options, how the ability to retaliate can be more useful than the ability to resist an attack, and how uncertain retaliation can be more credible and more efficient than certain ret retaliation. These insights have proven to be of great relevance for conflict resolution and the avoidance of war. The insights from the theory of repeated games help explain economic conflicts such as price wars and trade wars, but also why some communities are more successful than others in managing common pool resources like grasslands or irrigation systems. The repeated games approach has also eliminated the role of various institutions ranging from merchant guilds and organized crime to wage negotiations and international trade agreements. The two laureates approach this field from different angles, Aumann from mathematics and Schelling from economics. But they shared the vision that game theory had the potential to reshape the analysis of human interaction, a vision that to a large extent has been materialized. Current analysis of conflict and cooperation built almost exclusively on the foundations laid by Amon and Schelling. Thank you. Here's Tim Hartford from the BBC show More or Less to explain some of the practical significance of Dr. Schelling's work. The idea of the day was mutually assured destruction. It was von Neumann's phrase. And it was this. If the Soviets put one foot out of line, the United States will massively retaliate with atomic weapons. And then, of course, the Soviets will retaliate back and the world will end. And therefore, the Soviets will not put a foot out of line. And it, it, it had a certain appeal. There's a logic to it. It's the kind of logic that would come out of a man like von Neumann. The games that he worked on were almost exclusively something called zero-sum games. And in a zero-sum game, what I win, what you lose. What you win is what I lose. And in those kind of games, it's perhaps not surprising that von Neumann once remarked, if you say, bomb the Russians tomorrow, I say bomb them today. You say, bomb them at five o'clock, I say, why not one o'clock? That was John von Neumann. John von Neumann died in 1957. And just a few months later, Thomas Schelling arrived at Rand for the first time for a research sabbatical, a couple of months. And Schelling in some ways didn't fit in at Rand at all. He was, he was an East Coast academic in a West Coast research institution. He wore suits, he had a crew cut, a military bearing, although he'd never actually fought in the war. But in other ways, Schelling fitted in perfectly. He loved game theory. He spoke the language of game theory and he thought it was an incredibly powerful tool. But he thought it was a tool that had to be used differently. Tom Schelling had had a background in trade negotiation. He had worked on the Marshall Plan, rebuilding Europe after the Second World War. And so when Schelling thought about game theory, 
he didn't think about zero-sum games. He thought about games where there was always a common interest to explore, common ground to stand on. And Schelling insisted that, fine, the United States and the Soviet Union don't trust each other, they are implacable opponents, but yet it's not a zero-sum game. There is mutual interest to pursue. And an obvious example of that is strategic arms limitation. Schelling said, fine, you need a nuclear weapon each, you need 10 each, fine. You need 100 each, 1,000 each, 10,000 each, how many do you need? Who is this arms race actually benefiting? And Schelling argued it was in the interest of both sides to calm it down and to scale back their nuclear arsenals. And he was a real evangelist for arms limitation. But a less obvious example of these common interests lay in Schelling's focus on stability. I told you about mutually assured destruction. That's a balance of power, von Neumann's balance of power, not a very stable balance of power. And Schelling said, well, what happens if something goes wrong? What if some psychopathic colonel with an itchy trigger finger gets near the bomb? What if a plane accidentally flies into a no-fly zone or things get a bit tense at a border point? These things can happen. Things can go wrong. What resources do the great powers have to pull back from the brink of Armageddon? That's what happens. And according to Schelling's analysis, the answer was not a lot. And he set about convincing the world that it had to change. And he was no peacenik. He was absolutely focused on how to fight a nuclear war. Just thought we weren't doing it very well. One of the obvious things that was missing, obvious in retrospect, was the red telephone. Incredible as it might seem, in the late 1950s, there was no direct line of communication between Washington DC and Moscow. And Schelling said, you know what, it might be a really good idea. One was finally installed after the Cuban Missile Crisis, when it had been conclusively proved that Schelling had been absolutely right. It would have been really handy to have one. Well, I mentioned before that Dr. Schelling was responsible in part for one of the great dark comedies in movie history. He worked with Stanley Kubrick on the 1964 classic Dr. Strangelove. Here he tells the story. There used to be a magazine, a monthly magazine called The Reporter, and the editor of it made an interesting suggestion. He said, maybe you should look... There was a certain amount of literature on the, the future of nuclear war. Maybe I should review the literature on future war and see if writers of fiction had any interesting ideas about how a war might start. There were three such books, and I paid a lot of attention to the one called Red Alert because I said, this is the first plausible, detailed examination of how a war might actually get started. My article was published in... Uh, the London Saturday newspaper, and Stanley Kubrick was in London making a movie. And he read this newspaper, and he thought, sounds like a good show. So he called the publisher of Red Alert and got in touch with the author. And they came up to Cambridge and spent the whole afternoon and evening with me. We had a hard time getting the war started because when the, the book was published in 1958, there were no intercontinental missiles. But by now it was 1962 or three. The whole attack force wasn't any longer bombers, but it was missiles. And we, we had a hard time getting the war started. But I was always happy that I had stimulated that movie. So in a sense, Thomas Schelling had a hand in characters such as President Merkin Muffley, played by Peter Sellers. One of our base commanders, he had a sort of, well, he went a little funny in the head. You know, just a little funny. And... Uh, he went and did a silly thing. General Jack Ripper, played by Sterling Hayden. Mandrake, I suppose it never occurred to you that while we're chatting here so enjoyably, a decision is being made by the president and the Joint Chiefs in the war room at the Pentagon. The unforgettable General Buck Turgeson, played by George C. Scott. General Turgeson, I find this very difficult to understand. I was under the impression that I was the only one in authority to order the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, that's right, sir. You are the only person authorized to do so. And although I uh, hate to judge before all the facts are in, it's beginning to look like uh, General Rupert exceeded his authority. It certainly does. Far beyond the point I would have imagined possible. Mr. President, I'm not saying we wouldn't get our hair most. But I do say no more than 10 to 20 million killed, tops, uh, depending on the breaks. And of course, Peter Sellers again as Dr. Strangelove. It would not be difficult, my Fuhrer. Nuclear reactors could 
<laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. President. Nuclear reactors could provide power almost indefinitely. Greenhouses could maintain plant life. Animals could be bred and slaughtered. On a more serious note, Dr. Schelling also analyzed terrorism and nuclear weapons. The one thing people should worry about is the possibility that a terrorist could get hold of a nuclear weapon. And there, I somewhat comfort myself with the idea that if terrorists get nuclear weapons, they're going to have to build them. They may get fissile material by stealing it or buying it, but they're going to have to build the bomb. To do that, they're going to require a minimum of six or maybe eight or ten highly qualified scientists in a variety of different fields, in including mathematicians. They're going to have to get expert engineers and craftsmen who can deal with machinery at remarkable tolerances. It's, it's going to be a, an exceptionally demanding task to put together a workable bomb. Mm. They're going to be working together over probably months, at least weeks, but probably months, in seclusion, probably away from their families, away from their jobs, with very little to do except talk to each other about what is this bomb going to be used for if we ever get it completed or these bombs, if they're working on more than one. First, these are going to be very well-trained, intelligent people. They're probably not going to be obsessed with simply causing havoc, causing destruction, blowing up the biggest city they can think of blowing up. They're going to be asking themselves every night at dinner, how can we do something worthwhile with this weapon once we have it? And I have a hunch they will come to the conclusion that it's better to use it for influence than for destroying people and structures. Very likely, they're going to think of it as a device for deterring military aggression. They're going to think about whom they're trying to defend against military aggression by making a deterrent threat. It wouldn't surprise me if they ever use the weapon that they will use it against military targets. These are probably not the kinds of people who just enjoy murdering hundreds of thousands of people. And therefore, I think that they are going to be undergoing an experience of exploring in their own minds what it is we are doing this for, what can it be used for, what is it not good for, and maybe even the question, uh, depending on who's, who's organizing, whether, whether, they, whether they really want to complete the thing. So I think if, if they ever get to that point, it's going to be very demanding of their intelligence and their imagination. But to do it, and they will probably feel the people who build the bomb that they ought to have some say in how it's used. I don't think they're going to build a bomb and just turn it over to a Saddam Hussein or somebody like that. Later in life, Dr. Schilling turns his attention to why neighborhoods self segregate, and here's Tim Harford explaining his theory. Four decades ago, on a long haul flight, the economist Thomas Schilling was doodling with a pen and paper and thinking about the problem of racial segregation. When he got home, he picked up a chessboard to continue his investigations. And you can do the same thing. Simply lay out alternating black and white counters, or um, brown and white eggs. Remove any 20 and add five just to mix things up a bit. The board now represents a mixed neighborhood. Now these brown eggs aren't extreme racists. They're happy to live in a mixed neighborhood, but they don't want their white neighbors to outnumber their brown neighbors more than two to one. The white eggs feel exactly the same way. So take any egg that is outnumbered more than two to one and move it to the nearest acceptable location. As you do this, you'll find something astonishing happen. The brown eggs and the white eggs will separate out like oil and vinegar. Even a mild preference for the color of your neighbor can lead to extreme segregation. Thomas Schelling's chessboard experiments became famous and Schelling himself eventually won the Nobel Prize. For me, the experiments are about more than racial segregation. They show how, although we as individuals may be rational and we may be tolerant, the society that we produce together may be neither rational nor tolerant. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. We closed with Ella a couple of weeks back. Let's close with her again as a tribute to Thomas Schelling, doing a little bit of game theory by George Gershwin, and have her do it with Louis Armstrong, and let's call the whole thing off. So if you like pajamas, pajamas, I wear pajamas, you got pajamas, well, we, we know we, we need pajamas, pajamas slowly, very tall and coming up Let's go, let's go, let's go.